Now, so uh, good morning, everyone. I'm glad you could join us. Uh, I'm Justin Moss, um, the chair for RIA North, and I've been asked to uh, chair this session on the transport-led development for the north of England uh, and levelling up through delivery of transport infrastructure. So nice to see you all. Uh, we've got joining me uh, Stuart Jones, who um, is the delivery director for National Highways Regional Investment Programme. Uh, he's been with National Highways since 2017, but has 30 years of experience leading projects and programmes in the infrastructure sector. So I'll uh, allow him to introduce himself in a second. Uh, and Nicola Kane, who uh, joined Steer this month after eight years of transport for Greater Manchester, where she was the head of strategic planning for insight and innovation and led the development of uh, Greater Manchester's award for the uh, award-winning fourth local transport plan. So we are uh, looking forward to hearing from her. Uh, just to let you know, the session is being recorded and so will be uh, sent out for uh, people to look at afterwards. But uh, first, Stuart, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, by all means. So good morning, everyone. My name, um, I'm, I'm Stuart Jones, as um, Justin's already said. Um, I'm the Regional Delivery Director in the northwest of England for National Highways Major Projects Division. Um, so, so that really involves um, major improvements, typically over fifty million pounds. Um, we'll get into that um, in my presentation. But good morning. Thank you, Stuart. Uh, Nicola. Hi, everyone. Um, as Justin said, I've just recently joined Steer, so less than um, three weeks ago. So still pretty new in role, but had um, spent eight years working at Transport for Greater Manchester before this. So leading on strategic planning in particular, so developing long term transport plans um, and integrating the transport planning with the strategic development plan for Greater Manchester. So lots of experience in uh, integrating land use and transport planning. Um, so my presentation today will be um, fairly broad in focus, but very happy to kind of discuss some of the specific issues around Greater Manchester, which I'm obviously very familiar with from my previous role. Brilliant, thank you, Nicola. Um, so discussions today is we'll have um, two sort of around about 10 minute presentations from, from both of them. Um, and some of the overview of questions we're looking at is, uh, you know, what's the transport needs in the north of England? You know, what's infrastructure is required and how can this be delivered? Exploring some of those major programmes, plan in the north of England uh, and ensuring these schemes generate economic growth and levelling up. Um, obviously, my role is uh, Rail Infrastructure Association Chair for the North, represents uh, around 200 businesses, pretty much focused on the rail industry. But obviously, on my other hat within Seems Mobility, we work in the highways for looking at decarbonising HGVs, etc. So I'm really looking forward to hearing what sort of those transport needs are and uh, and how we can deliver them and ensure that we do get that levelling up and economic growth. So uh, we'll start with Nicola. I look forward to seeing your slides. Great, thank you. I'll just share my screen. Is that so, showing? That is showing. Sorry, one thing I forgot to say for if anyone's got any questions, if they can put it in the Q&A panel and I'll um, bring those up afterwards because uh, that's the way that Zoom's working. So yes, thank you. I can see your size, Nicola. I'll let you go. That's brilliant. Thank you very much. Uh, Zoom is always a bit hit and miss for me, so hopefully this works fine. Um, so yeah, as I said, I'm going to talk um, a bit about the high level challenges around levelling up um, and the uh, relationship with transport and transport investment in the north. Um, I'm, my background is Greater Manchester, so if you have sort of specific questions around um, some of the priorities in Greater Manchester, um, I'll be hopefully well placed to answer some of those as well when we get to the Q&A. Uh, right, so if I can move that on. Um, so just to begin with, in terms of setting the scene, um, a number of you may have seen Transport for the North's recent uh, transport related social exclusion report. They commissioned some really good research, which has just re very recently been published, um, which talks about the scale of the challenge being faced by um, people across the North in accessing essential day-to-day -day services and employment opportunities. And it really shines um, a very clear spotlight on the scale of the challenge with around 3.3 million people uh, living in areas which can be considered as um, experiencing transport related social exclusion. 
Um, and that then, if people aren't able to access those really important opportunities, that can then lead to a really vicious cycle around po poverty, isolation, uh, and really poor access to very basic services. So it's a, it's a huge issue, um, not just in the North, but particularly in the North. Um, and their research shows that around one in five, just over 20% of people in the North are experiencing transport-related social exclusion, uh, which compares to about 16% um, in the South and the Midlands. So it's an issue across the country, but um, seems to be particularly acute in the north of England. Um, so the report goes on to talk a bit about some of the drivers of that transport related social exclusion. So it starts by focusing in on some of the challenges around public transport availability. So some areas very poorly served by public transport uh, or have times of day or week when they don't have access to services. Uh, the fact that public transport services are often um, unreliable, uh, so people can't necessarily rely, rely on them to get to work on time, for example, um, and can often be very expensive, particularly for those living on um, low incomes. The report also highlights the fact that walking and cycling infrastructure has been underinvested in for a number of decades and that a number of people, uh, that, that can then be a barrier for people accessing those local services in particular. Uh, and for people who um, perhaps have mobility problems, use a wheelchair and so on, then those, those barriers can be even more acute. And all of these problems mean that a lot of people um, who might be struggling on very low incomes often feel forced to purchase and, and run a car and use a large proportion of their limited disposable income running a car. So it, it highlights the issue of forced car ownership, um, which again has a whole uh, range of knock-on effects in terms of what people then have available to spend on, on other things. Uh, and we also know that people in, on low incomes often are less able to um, often do jobs that are less able to work from home or hybrid working. So again, and we saw this through the pandemic, that those groups tend to be uh, really reliant on transport to, to get, get to work. The report is, is helpful in that it highlights some kind of key principles around a more socially inclusive transport system. Uh, so it talks about the need to make sure essential services uh, can be accessed without a car. It talks about the need to cater for more diverse travel patterns. So often our public transport networks focus on accessing key centres um, during the peak sort of Monday to Friday periods, but perhaps don't cater so well for people doing shift work and needing to access those opportunities out of those core hours. Um, it flags the need for be a better integrated public transport system, but also perhaps new shared services, demand responsive services, car clubs, um, cycle hire, those kind of schemes that can help to fill some of the gaps in the mainstream public transport network. Uh, and also, um, flags the need for all transport services to be accessible for uh, for everybody, no matter what their mobility um, uh, uh, abilities are. So if they're in a wheelchair, for example, can they actually get on, on those bus services or, or local rail services? Technology is becoming increasingly important. So whether that's um, uh, people using their phones to get information about services, to pay for services, um, and that, that can be fantastic, but uh, it can also be a barrier if you don't ac have access to devices or you don't have the right digital connectivity in your area. Um, and, then, and then it focuses on, actually, we need to provide some of these services closer to where people live. So thinking about things like that 20 minute neighborhood concept and giving people good local access to the day to day services they need. And then finally, uh, the report flags the need for um, public transport services to be more affordable um, and to be safe, particularly for people traveling um, out of core hours in the evenings and so on. Uh, and women in particular can often feel excluded from services because they don't feel safe using them after dark. And some of these issues were also flagged in the Leveling Up white paper, which seems like ages ago, but was only published earlier this, this year. Um, but those of you who are familiar with that paper know that there was a mission, um, a key core, one of the core missions in that paper was around local public transport um, and improving the con connectivity available by public transport, bringing that closer to the sort of provision you have in London across the country by 2030 with better integrated services, simpler ticketing, uh, simpler fares, 
and integrated ticketing. So I think that's a great ambition, um, but I think we're a long way off achieving that. And there's going to need to be a lot of investment, uh, both in capital and in new infrastructure, but also in uh, revenue to operate new services. So I just wanted to flag some of the investment that is going into transport. So it's not all uh, doom and gloom. Um, there is a huge amount of investment going on, particularly in the cities. Uh, and about this time last year, there was a big announcement that the mayoral combined authorities were going to be uh, given a major settlement suit through the city region, a sustainable transport fund to really start to invest over the next five years in a more sustainable transport system. Uh, and you can see some of the allocations there that went to the big cities in the north. So um, I was very heavily involved in the Greater Manchester submission. Um, the final settlement, including local contributions, is 1.2 billion. So that gives a really good basis for planning and investing um, in, in new transport infrastructure in particular over the next five years. Uh, West Yorkshire got 830 million, uh, Liverpool 710 um, and Yorkshire and Tees Valley also got reasonably substantial um, settlements. So that has given those cities a much better basis, a slightly longer term basis than, we, uh, than we've had in, in recent decades to start to plan and deliver improvements to those transports um, infrastructure. And in particular, if you look across those settlements, um, there's a lot of investment going into things like bus priority, uh, better uh, bus revision to some of these more poorly served locations, improved passenger facilities, so upgrades to stations um, and interchanges, um, and also um, quite significant investment in active travel. Uh, and there are some other funding sources going in um, to some, some places, not all authorities um, have access to bus service improvement plans, which again is looking at improving bus services and uh, reducing fares for services, but not all authorities got that, that was on a competitive basis. Uh, so that's quite a patchy picture across the north of England. Um, and uh, some authorities also have access to active travel funding and zero emission funding. So investment going in, but it's very heavily concentrated in the big urban areas um, and um, it, it doesn't, it's not necessarily being matched with the revenue funding that will be needed to operate more uh, transport services in those areas. I just wanted to also flag the importance of good um, development planning, land use planning as well, and how important that is to tackle some of these access issues. Um, so some of you might, might be familiar with this um, with this concept of triple access planning. It was one that was developed by uh, Professor Glenn Lyons at University of Western England, where he, folk, he flags that good access to services isn't just about having good transport, it's about land use planning, so it's people's proximity to those services. Again, coming back to that kind of idea of a 20 minute city where you've got um, good access to services uh, within your local area. And increasingly that digital connectivity is playing a really important role in giving people access to services. And we've obviously seen an acceleration of that during COVID where lots more people working from home, lots more people getting access to local health services, for example, through digital access. So we need to be thinking about all three of these dimensions. Um, and from a planning and transport perspective, there's a really good piece of work, um, which I had some involvement in um, by the CAHT, which is well worth a look if you haven't seen it, that provide some really good best practice um, recommendations on how we can better integrate land use and transport planning. So I'm just going to finish off. That's given. That's a very whistle-stop overview of some of the big issues um, across transport and levelling up. And happy to dive into some of that detail in the in the Q and A session if that would be useful. There are a number of sort of challenges which I can see in actually making um, some progress towards levelling up. Um, with respect to, to transport and transport related social inclusion. Um, I've flagged some of them on, on this slide here. So um, funding is always gonna be a big, a big barrier. Um, transport um, infrastructure in particular is expensive. Um, local authorities, transport authorities need long-term certainty around funding to be able to plan um, a short and long-term pipeline of infrastructure improvements. So we do need to see um, more certainty around long-term investment in transport. And it'll be interesting to see what comes out of the autumn statement today around transport. 
Um, but it, it, it's not just about infrastructure, uh, transport needs, revenue, um, investment to um, to keep services running. Uh, and those um, those budgets have been increasingly cut in, in recent decades. So we do need to see more revenue funding going into transport. Um, and it is a concern, particularly outside of the mayoral combined authorities um, in terms of where that funding is going to come from. Uh, and we need to make sure that all authorities have, have good access to transport funding. Post COVID, there's obviously a whole range of other challenges. Um, people have been using public transport less, that's starting to um, pick up again, um, but we're gonna need to really um, market those public transport services really well to all parts of society. Um, so they're not just seen as a last resort um, and, and that's gonna be a, a high priority for, for authorities and operators over the coming months and years. Um, all of those programs that I mentioned, those CRSGS programs, for example, they're big complex delivery challenges for authorities. Um, so that's gonna be a big challenge and they're gonna need a lot of community engagement to make sure that the right schemes are developed um, and that we take communities uh, with us in delivering all of those schemes. So that's gonna be really important. Um, and then as I've already mentioned, um, ensuring new development is accessible and sustainable is going to be key. There's a lot of new development going in across the north of England. We need to make sure those new schemes are designed to be as sustainable and accessible as possible to make sure we're not locking in some of these problems in, into, the, um, into future development. Um, and of course, we need to make sure that all modes are, are planned and integrated um, uh, much more effectively than they are at the moment. And we need to look to new modes like car clubs, like bike share and so on uh, to fill some of those gaps and to provide people with a real alternative to using the car. Um, and last but not least, I haven't really mentioned carbon. That's obviously the other huge challenge um, that we're facing. Transport emissions make up about a third of all carbon emissions. We need to make sure that transition to net zero not only happens quickly, but happens in a way that um, doesn't leave the poorest parts of society behind. So that just transition to net zero is um, a huge opportunity, but also um, a big challenge over the coming, coming years. So thank you very much. And I look forward to uh, a discussion uh, after Stuart's presentation. Thank you, Nicola. Um, yes, there has been a couple of questions. So if anyone can uh, continue to put some of those questions on and what we'll do is we'll take them together when after Stuart's done his presentation as well. Okay. Stuart. Yeah. So Maxine's going to share my slides, um, assuming our, um, our IT holds up. Um, just just while we while those slides come up, um, my background is as a project and program manager. Um, worked in the um, infrastructure industry virtually all of my career, um, but only for the last sort of seven years have I been in in um, in highways. Um, so I'm by no means an expert in highways um, I know a little bit about project and program management. So it probably will be a little bit um, less detailed on, on transport planning, etc. And a little bit more of an overview of national highways and what we're doing in the northwest. So um, just by way of an introduction, then um, national highways operates under license from government um, and our role is to operate, maintain and enhance uh, the strategic road network. We'll come on to that in a minute. So we were established under, um, under the brand of Highways England in 2015. And, and we deliver um, in regulatory periods of about five years, which, which are termed as the RIS, the, the Roads Investment Strategy. Um, we're in the middle of um, RIS 2, um, which runs from um, 2020 to 2025. And as part of RIS2, we'll be delivering £27 billion worth of improvements um, across the network in England um, over that five-year period. We, have, we were renamed as National Highways in 2021, and part of the justification for that renaming is that we've got a wider, a wider brief um, in that we're the custodians um, of, the, of, the, of the standards. Um, and we've got a wider role to influence and challenge um, industry um, to improve um, and contribute to the government's um, vision 
for for the road network and um, how we do that sustainably. So if I move on to the next slide, um, so this gives you a little bit of facts about uh, roads and the strategic road network. So um, just to just to try and um, quantify that for you a little bit. So 95 billion miles are travelled on the strategic road network every year. Um, it carries, we carry three times more people than the, the rail network does. 34% of traffic use the SRN and 68% of, of freight travels via the SRN. Um, and as you can see there on the, on the final block, 97% of journeys are made by road. Um, so slightly broader than, than the SRN. So we like to say that the, um, the SRN connects the country um, and really, it is the uh, the artery of of the country. So, if I move on from this one, um, hit you with some more facts. This is really about um, RIS two uh, and what RIS two will will deliver for us. So, um, we will, as part of that twenty seven billion pounds investment, um, I'm going to start with the yellow block there. 14 of it is invested in major improvements. And, and those major improvements will, will reduce traffic congestion and, and give people back 20 million hours per year. Um, as I said before, we, we're there to connect the country. So we link to ports, we link to um, distribution hubs and places like that. Um, we will deliver through RIST, RIST 2 over 50 schemes. Um, which will help us to support up to 64,000 jobs um, and obviously create new homes um, for, or enable new homes for people. So those, those are the background facts around the SRN. If I just move on to talk a little bit about enhancement projects in the north. Um, so, the, so I've classified the north here um, as um, what we what we... Um, call it's two regions in national highways the northwest and, and yorkshire northeast so um running from cheshire and um south yorkshire right up to the to the border with scotland so over the next race by the end of race two we will have delivered um 20 schemes and um, we'll have four in construction we'll have we'll have delivered 2.24 billion pounds of investment in the north, and and typically that has a return of about two, so that will be putting in 4.5 billion to our economy. Um, clearly, national highways doesn't deliver this alone. We we do this through um, um, strategic relationships with our suppliers, um, and if I, if I move on to the next slide, we have. Um, for RIS2, we've put in place our regional delivery partnership. I'll come on in a moment to who's part of that um, delivery partnership. But this in the north, it covers the, the regions that I've just I've just um, outlined. So uh, between myself and my colleague who, who delivers the major projects in North in Yorkshire and the Northeast, we use the supp same supply chain. So we get quite a lot of collaboration across the north. Um, but the, the basis of that um, regional delivery partnership was to establish regional models. So it's replicated through the country. Um, the intent behind it is that we get our designers and our contractors working together early. Um, and that we try and drive innovation through that early involvement, but also um, a consistent and visible um, work bank. Um, we want um, we want the um, investment and the delivery to link to national highways imperatives. Um, what do I mean by national highways in imperatives? So our imperatives are um, safety, safety for our customers, safety for people working on our network, um, customer, um, minimizing the disruption and, and providing really good information to our customers. Um, and then reliable and predictable delivery. Those are our imperatives. 
Um, we have a series of performance uh, metrics, as you would expect, um, and there's opportunity for us to learn together um, how, to, how to enhance performance. It's about long term relationships between us, our suppliers and the suppliers interacting together. Um, clearly a programmatic approach because um, each of the suppliers has a portfolio of projects to deliver, but also we work together, as I keep saying, um, to try and share that knowledge and expertise. Hopefully, and the intent was that the RDP will create an opportunity for suppliers to invest, which we need if we're going to develop sustainable um, highways for the future. Um, and creates a, an opportunity for our, our suppliers to grow um, together. So very quickly moving on, um, this just shows you who our partners are in the north. So lots of familiar names. Um, we've got traditional contractors in there, but we've also got um, um, consultants um, working alongside and providing technical assurance. Um, so if I move on from, from that and start to look more specifically at the schemes in the northwest of England, um, I'm just going to give you very, um, very highlights of some of these schemes. Um, I won't talk about the F585 Windy Harbour simply because I'm going to use it as a little bit of a case study in, in a minute. Um, but um, that one is in construction, as I say, I'll talk more about it in, in a moment. The A533 is um, a job that we're doing on behalf of our um, operations uh, part of the business at the moment. Um, that's one of our, our more, more critical assets at the end of its life and, and critical to replace. Um, you might have seen some footage on LinkedIn recently. Um, at the end of October, we, um, we took that bridge down onto the motorway and, and placed it on the, the new piers and abutments for it. Um, fantastic piece of engineering there. But now we've got to um, crack on, connect the ends um, and bring that, that bridge into service before we demolish the existing bridge. Um, some other schemes that we've got that are in development at the moment. Um, we've got our Loon Gorge um, program. Again, this is another project we're delivering on behalf of operations. It replaces um, eight structures um, that are coming to the end of their asset life along the M6. Um, so we're in contract with Kia um, on this project and we hope to um, start work on the network on this one, perhaps towards the end of um, um, 2024. Um, so, so that's up um, in the Cumb Cumbria area, just probably South Cumbria. <clears throat> we'll move on to the A66. A66 is, is sort of a um, cross-region project. It straddles the, um, the Northwest and, and Yorkshire Northeast. And we've, we've broken out a particular team to lead this, so it doesn't fall into my remit. But it does use that same framework and those same suppliers. And it's one of the successes that's come out of, of our delivery framework there. Because what we've got there is a partnership agreement in place between um, four of those key suppliers to deliver that program of works to, to dual the A66 between Penrith and Scotch Corner. Um, we, are, we, we recently submitted the DCO for that scheme. So we're just preparing ourselves for the, the hearings on that scheme. The A57 is a, I think it's about a four mile bypass out over in Mottram there. Um, really delighted to say that we got our development consent order approved yesterday uh, by, by the new Secretary of State. So um, it's, it's pedal to the floor now and get that project on site. Um, we should be starting in construction um, in spring of next year. Um, so watch this space on that one. And that one's being delivered for us by Balfour BT in partnership with um, um, Atkins. I had, a, I had a blank there for a moment. Wouldn't have wanted to get it wrong. Um, M60 Simister Island. So um, for those who don't know, 
Um, that is the junction of the M60, the M62 and the M66. People who, who drive through there will, will know that bizarrely you have to come off the M66, travel through, sorry, come off the M60, travel through some traffic lights to continue on the M60. And what we're going to do is make that a free flow junction um, between all of those, those major motorways. Um, we're just preparing for consultation um, and hope to be going out to consultation on that scheme early next year. And that scheme is being delivered for us by um, a partnership of Costain and Jacobs. Um, project that's a little bit, it's been around for a, for a while, but it's a, it's a, a bit earlier in its state of development for a, for a combination of, of reasons is the A5036 Princess Way. Um, and we're just in the process of just refining some of the work on that scheme and, and bringing um, some of our documentation up to date. Um, with the intention of, of, of consulting on it at some point next calendar year. Um, there are a couple of projects there that you might recognise that were, have been completed since the since um, Highways England Stroke National Highways were, were formed. The A556, which was, again, um, a new offline bypass um, that I think it opened for traffic around about 2017, has been really beneficial um, in that part of uh, South Manchester and Cheshire. And another one that we opened recently was, which was November last year, delivered by um, Amy SRM, was the M6 Junction 19 scheme, where we, we've we provided a direct connection as you travel off the M6 and onto the M6 um, to the A556. So it completes that, that route for us. Um, so if I move on from there, um, we touched on this before, um, the future of, of a roads programme um, relies on us being um, um, reliable um, and trusted custodians of the environment. So we cannot just um, carry on building roads. We have to be sensitive to the needs of the environment. So we're, we're supporting the government's ambition for 20 um, 2050 net zero. Uh, we've got our own um, carbon net zero plan in there, uh, which says that um, for our own premises and facilities, we'll be at net zero by 2030. By 2040, um, we will be operating and maintaining our network at net zero. And by 2050, as we start to see the fleet transition over to electric, um, the goal is for net zero for, for the SRM. So some ambitious goals there. Um, the interesting one there is we've got a, an important role, as I said earlier, to start to influence one, uh, influence the wider industry. Um, so how do we how do we put the facilities in place for EV? Um, you know, the other things that we'll be doing is plant. We plan to plant three million trees over the next um, five years. We're moving all of our own lighting to LED. Um, but an interesting one that um, I heard our sustainability director talk about recently was working with tire manufacturers to influence them to use low carbon because we generate carbon through the wear of, of the tires on, on the network. So that's an interesting one. We've got to continue to address um, air quality. We've got to address noise. Um, and we've got to support the um, environmental strategy. So we'll have a requirement moving forward um, for any scheme that we deliver to bring a 10% improvement to biodiversity. Up, up until date, it's been to break, to break even. Um, but we've got to go beyond that. Um, Another important aspect, if I, if I just move on, is, is around delivering social value. Um, so that's about um, local investment, using local supply chains, um, encouraging small and, and medium, medium size enterprises, about developing skills. Um, I've already talked about how we, how we enhance and improve 
the environment. Uh, but we've got a responsibility as well to connect communities and provide facilities for communities um, and to um, provide um, and create an industry that, that drives equality, diversity and inclusion of, of all parts of society. So, um, you know, we've got a broad range as, as national highways of, of responsibilities. As I say, we're not just about building and operating roads. If I move on onto the A585, which I promised I would do, um, I'll try and bring some of this to life a little bit for you. So uh, the A585 is a scheme um, out on the file coast near to Fleetwood. Um, it's a, um, a four mile dual carriageway that we're, that we're putting in there that bypasses the village of Little, Sing Little Singleton, where we have um, major congestion. Um, we, we started on site on this scheme back in 2020. It's being delivered in partnership with Kia. Um, and the goals of the scheme are, are to reduce journey times, to reduce congestion, um, to provide predictable journeys. Um, we've got to provide um, better facilities for pedestrian cyclists and, and horse riders. And there's, there's a number of crossings that we provide um, along the route. Um, a feature of the scheme will be to drive less accidents, support local growth, um, some big new housing developments going in on, on the very vicinity of, of the site that, um, that this new road will, will really support and enable. And we're going to increase the biodiversity. So our requirements on this scheme were net zero on, on biodiversity. So um, basically to balance out what, what, we, um, what we damage, but we've gone a lot further than that. If I move on, um, I will talk about how, the, how we um, influenced social values on this scheme um, to try and bring some of that to life. So we've, we've provided seven apprentices, apprentices. I should say this slide's a little bit out of date as well. It goes back to last year. Uh, or sorry, to the early part of this year. So um, some of this will have been improved um, since the slides were put together, but seven apprenticeships, eight graduates, um, placements for veterans and, and, and um, summers, um, lots of educational visits. Um, um, and as you can see, we valued it at £600,000 of of social impact that we've brought there. Um, over 300,000 with SMEs, 230 through skills and employment, and we've invested 2,000 in charity. Um, I'm starting to draw to a close now, I'm getting the hurry up from Justin. Um, so uh, just wanted to touch on, on the next one though, to, to sort of highlight that environmental responsibility that we're delivering through the scheme. Um, if you could just move on, one for me, Maxine. Um, I think that the one of the, the 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 one that I really want to draw out on this is the increased biodiversity that this scheme is is delivering. So I said our our requirement was was to balance out at zero. We've actually provided eighteen percent improvement on this scheme through um, the new ponds, the ecology um, um, that we've we've provided. Um, and, and the habitats that we've we've provided there. So that's one that we're really, really proud of. Um, and we started to explore how we can um, use um, electric vehicles for our plant and um, to operate the facilities that we've we've got on site. If we skip on to my last side, slide, please, Maxine. Um, I, I just, it, it's the one after this one. Um, I think the future um, for the roads investment strategy for RIS3 is likely to change. So through the first two roads periods, we've we've had a significant investment in improving the network. Um, moving forward, it's likely to be smaller schemes that we're going to be delivering. Uh, we think we've got the network that we need at this point in time. So it's just about optimising that network is, is going to be the challenge, together with 
you know, improving air quality, reducing carbon um, and, and enhancing uh, biodiversity. Um, so I'll wrap it up at that point and then we can leave some time for questions. Thank you very much, Stuart, and uh, thank you for your presentation as well, Nicola. Um, right, so yeah, if people want to keep uh, adding questions to the chat, there's a, a couple there. So um, the first one, I think, going back to Nicola, is they're talking about the TRSE report. Um, and they're talking around sort of what needs to change to remove the exclusions, both locally and nationally, because they don't see that buses is necessarily the, the, the only solution to do it, and they need the uh, reliable rail services. Yeah, can you can you hear me? Okay, I can't see anyone for some reason. Yeah, you can hear it. Okay, that's good. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I agree that rail rail based modes, and obviously in Manchester we have Met Metrolink as um, as well as heavy rail, um, need to play a really important role, particularly on getting people into uh, the city centre. Um, but it's also clear that. Um, I think this is the case in most of our urban areas that we don't necessarily have the population density to justify rail-based schemes across the whole of a big conurbation area. So I, I, I do think the buses have a really important role to play in that, that context in connecting uh, different places together, more dispersed um, settlements. Um, but even that, that can be challenging um, to, to run a bus service to those kind of locations if you don't have the scale of demand. And that's uh, why we've seen a lot of service cuts over time. So, so longer term, we definitely need to make sure we're putting in the right uh, land use development policies to make sure we get those densities, to make sure we're putting developments in the sorts of locations where they can be well served by more mass transit options. But but I do think the buses have a really important role to play. Um, and, um, you know, Greater Manchester is, has made a decision to franchise bus services, which means um, we'll be able to integrate them better into um, with things like the Metrolink system and hopefully in time with, with rail as well, both in terms of the timings of those services and also the, uh, the ticketing. So we've got integrated fares. That's going to be really important. Um, and... Um, a big part of the program, the CRSTS program in Greater Manchester, is about providing whole route upgrades for orbital trips, where you will struggle certainly in the short short run to make the case or even to to find the space to put rail based connections between our towns. So we've got a number of um, big towns um, uh, sort of circling the conurbation. So putting in orbital connections between those towns that provide better bus priority also provide improved walking and cycling <coughs> links into and between the towns I think is a really important intervention to help tackle social exclusion <coughs> and a lot of our more um, uh, deprived low, low income populations live um, outside of the, the city centre um, and live in and around in and around those towns so a lot of those services can provide be provided there but they need um, they need to be well served um, by public transport and we had this kind of idea um, particularly on those bigger corridors of think tram but do bus so provide bus services which are of you know equivalent quality and attractiveness um, to the source of provision you get um, with with um, light rail uh, and I, I think that's really important so I, th I think both modes have a really important role to play in tackling social in in exclusion um, but as I said before it's not just about infrastructure investment it's about investing in, in services um, and we probably need to be much more open to um, subsidizing services in a way that most other big cities across the world do um, uh, and we've been more reluctant to do in general in, the, in this country. Thank you, Nicola. I suppose bringing that you into this, Stuart, as well, is um, <clears throat> obviously in part of uh, your presentation, you talked around um, the need for where the infrastructure is going for the roads to increase uh, for circa 64,000 jobs and new homes. How is consideration linking into that sort of public transport and net zero as well then, so that you've got the road network and the sort of public transport as well? Yeah, I mean, um, I think lining up and connecting with the with the um local networks is 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 key and and in, and you know we've got a scheme out there in manchester northwest quadrants is one that we're looking at at the moment um which is um it runs basically down from rochdale down to sale um on the m60 there um if we're going to improve that corridor um a lot of the traffic using using that section of the m60 
is commuter traffic. So how we connect in with the local roads um, and connect to local transport is absolutely going to be key to um, the success of, of any scheme there. Brilliant, thank you. And um, one of the questions just popped up is around the hype of EVs and recent studies showing that uh, you know, battery fires, hard to extinguish, etc. Um, and investing in more bus rail and slowly re removing cars being a better solution. I suppose it's um, you know, how does that fit in with the, the thought process? Obviously, there is a lot of studies at the moment being done around sort of electric roads, big batteries, hydrogen, certainly on the HGV side. How's that, those plans sort of being wrapped into that consideration? I think I think for me, um, just just going back to the some of the stats that that I shared at the at the um, at the start, particularly around um, freight. If you if you look at freight, sixty eight percent of all freight uses the SRM, relies on the SRM. Um, so in terms of the SRM, um, I think I think. I'd say roads are here to set. Roads are here to stay. Clearly, um, what we've got to do though is make them somehow environmentally sustainable. So we've got to create that um, network, influence industry. So we've been tra doing trials on um, HGV fleets, um, so, so traveling as a fleet up the network, looking at um, supporting investment in hydrogen and providing the facilities for electric vehicles. I mean, electric vehicles are at the heart of the government's plan, aren't they, to, to, net, to get to net zero. Um, I recognise we're still learning about them, um, but if we, our role is to support the government's plan and put the facilities in um, to enable um, EV. Fair enough. And Nicola, so obviously that, <clears throat> Stuart's talked around sort of like this sort of strategic road network, which obviously covers the sort of the, the, the transport between, I suppose. What about the final mile? Because obviously uh, we've got the public transport is very much talked around sort of moving public around, but what? how does freight fit in within that? Yeah, I mean, we've uh, that's where a lot of the growth in, of traffic in a urban areas certainly has come from, is those last last mile deliveries. Um, and that's probably been accelerated during COVID as more and more people are having having stuff delivered to, to their, their homes and offices. That That is a major challenge that um, is, is quite tricky to get hold of, but I think there are all sorts of innovative solutions that we're starting to see being rolled out, like you know use, using e-cargo bikes for that, that final mile. But it's gonna need a lot of joined up planning with local authorities, with, um, uh, logistics providers so I think there's there's still a lot of work to do but I think there are some innovative solutions that could also uh, reduce costs for um, providers and using things like lockers of course is another way of starting to consolidate some of those movements but I think it's going to it's going to be a big challenge um, and one that we're going to need to get get to grips with over over the coming years um, and going back to the question about e EVs um, <coughs> We can't rely purely on electrifying the fleet. There's all sorts of reasons why that um, can't, can't be the only solution. Of course, we do need to transition to zero emission vehicles across um, all of road, road transport, but we also need to look at how we can reduce people's dependence on private vehicles. Um, and a lot of that is driven by around social um, exclusion. Um, we all know electric cars are at the moment at least are a lot more expensive to, to purchase um, so they're out of reach for a lot of people on low incomes um, and they then that they they then don't benefit from some of those lower operating costs so we need to use this transition as an opportunity to rethink our dependency on pri private vehicles to provide alternatives to reshape how we kind of design our towns and cities to make them easier uh, to access without a car um, and to provide some of those alternatives like car clubs I think that they're going to be a massively important part of the solution um, so people have access to um, a car when they need one but they don't need to own one um, so I think if we're going to get to net zero we need to look at all of those solutions and we need to be rolling them out very quickly over the next uh, certainly making real progress over the next decade thank you very much <clears throat> and then final question for both of you um as i'm conscious of time is um obviously someone's put on there around um regarding the public transport network what's the key lesson learned from areas for for the best and most developed public transport systems i.e 
Greater Manchester and how can they be applied to drive public transport improvements in areas such as Leeds, which is sort of in their development space. And I suppose it's like, you know, what learnings is even Greater Manchester looking at from sort of broad of other cities and that. So I suppose with this question, probably in a couple of minutes, Nicola, what's what what's been learned and what um, what can be improved in other areas? And then when we come to you, Stuart, and you know, same thing, I suppose, with what's been learned in RIS 2 that's going to be taken into RIS 3. Yes, I suppose, um, I think from a Greater Manchester perspective, there have been quite a few um, kind of ingredients to, to his, its success, I suppose. Um, one of them is about long term planning and I think having a clear vision of what you want for your city and for the transport system that serves it. That was certainly the case um, in the um, development of the Greater Manchester Transport Fund, which um, funded the most recent extensions of the Metrolink system so there was a long-term plan that took a lot of development so it does take a lot of time and effort to develop the vision um, to develop that out in in some detail so you can make a really clear and compelling case um, there was a lot of um, political will I think bringing together you know 10 leaders across 10 local authorities to say this is what we want we want a Metrolink system um, for the whole of Greater Manchester um, that takes um you know a lot of a lot of effort to develop that political um uh, unity um, and then to lobby hard for that uh, and then i think to make the case in a really compelling way to government to show the economic social and environmental benefits of investing in a sustainable transport network over the long term uh, and again i think that's been a strength of greater manchester's where they've been able to provide that clear and compelling evidence and then they've consistently told uh, people that story over over a number of years to be able to really build build up the case um, and, and then you get into a kind of virtuous cycle of you, you learn how to do these schemes you learn how to deliver them effectively and then that helps to make the case for uh, for future investment um, so that's some of my reflections um, of uh, of working in in the greater manchester environment um, but it, it'd be good good to hear from uh, Stuart as well about maybe some of the learnings around RIS. Yeah, thanks, Nicola. Stuart? So, yeah, so it's not particular. It's not particular to this question because um, it's it's not one that I can talk about with any degree of knowledge. But um, I guess I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about our designated funds program that that we have, which which are about um, investing in facilities for local communities as much as anything. So that runs from environmental and biodiversity to cycleways and connectivity, working with local partners to put those facilities in place. We've really struggled with, with that programme um, to, to, to make those connections. So we, we've kind of got there by hook or by crook, but I think that's definitely an area that we can we can prove our improve our delivery in and and partner up better on <clears throat> fantastic so that pretty much leaves us almost bang on time with a couple of minutes left so <clears throat> i was going to thank Stuart and nicola for their time today and some really uh, valuable insights and information um i just uh, hope everyone else uh, has enjoyed this and enjoys it sending on the video to other people to look at etc but uh, i'm sure if there's any questions and stuff like that if you send them on then uh, certainly be considered but uh, i thank everyone for their time today and uh, i'll see you soon thanks justin thanks everyone yeah thank you bye now